So welcome all. It's a great pleasure for me to present to you Oscar Silvit Flores. He's a, a he comes from Catalonia, from the uh, digital legends and entertainment, where he has 12 years uh, experience developing the uh, Charisma engine, or actually the subsystem, um, which is in charge of collision and physics. He also has a PhD from the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya, uh, which I visited. It's a very nice university. And he is also a professor at the Universidad Pompeu Fabra, also in Catalunya. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. The same for me. Buenas tardes. Uh, so, what we'll talk today about is basically how we do. How we do physics in games. It's not going to be a talk about physics, like uh, serious physics. It's going to be about how we use uh, physics in games to do the kinds of things we need to, we need to do. So I'll start with a short introduction. Uh, he already presented myself. Uh, so that will be fast. Then I will talk about the company, uh, this the Legends Entertainment. Then we'll have a look about uh, on uh, physics, physics engines, what do they do, how they work uh, on the inside, uh, only, we'll only overview it. Uh, and finally, we'll see how, which are the, the, the current um, challenges and, and open problems that we have in physics for games, what we can not do yet, and, and what we can do to fix it. And I'll give some takeaways, like if you want to put physics in your games, these are the things that work, these are the things that do not work. It's not going to be very technical. It's going, and please stop me whenever you want. Uh, ask, uh, feel free to to stop me. So that's me, and that's important. I'm not a physicist. She is. So if I say something that is not physically correct, probably it doesn't matter because in games we don't need to do like real world physics. We need to do what the player expects to to happen in the game. <coughs> so what is physics? From a computer science engineer point of view, it's like looking at, at nature. It's, nature is a very complex thing that looks like assembler or, or, or worse. And we try to kind of disassemble, like peek into it. We need to take in, into account all uh, length, length and, and energy scales from atoms to galaxies. We also not need to take into account all kinds of, of phenomena, like nuclear physics, uh, astronomy, electricity, dynamics, uh, thermodynamics, basically everything that happens in nature uh, may be um, investigated by physics. And the final idea or the final objective is to kind of reverse engineer it and get some math that, get, that gives us the same results. And that's exactly what we want in the game. We want some math, some code that reproduces the, the phenomena we get in in the real world inside the game. Of course, we have a lot of constraints and we, I would, I, I think I can say that we will never be able to reproduce reality like one dot dot one, but, okay, anybody got the, the joke? But we need it, at least we need to pretend to be doing like real physics simulation for a, for a number of, of aspects of the game. The first one is animation. If we want objects to move as they do in, in the real world, we, uh, we have to reproduce the laws of, the laws of movement, uh, object collisions, etc. To get animations that, uh, if we had to uh, make them by, by hand, would be very, very difficult. Imagine this this deck of cards falling. Uh, if an animation had to do, if an animator had to do this animation by hand, it would it would take a lot of time. It would be not realistic. You would not conserve energy, etc. So we need for animation. We also need to use physics, sorry, at large for render. Uh, rendering is basically throwing rays into, into stuff and knowing how light behaves and gets into the eye of the, of the observer. So we need to know about light, uh, the interaction with materials, etc. Uh, now it's very common that games have PBR, physically based render, rendering, which we, 
to use in the in the last game. You'll see a video later. It's also uh, useful to use physics for sound. When you drop something on the ground, the the the, the atmosphere vibrates, the waves propagate, they get into your ears, and you hear the sound. In a game, when you throw something to the ground, nothing happens. You need to detect that collision. Because otherwise, if you don't work to detect that, it's not going to be detected. And when this collision happens, we have to do something, like play a sound. It is possible to generate the sound that objects make when they collide. So we can use physics for sound. And also, maybe the most important thing we need, we need physics for is to just make up stupid, uh, stupid plots for sci-fi movies or, or video games. I don't know if you have played Half-Life 2 or Half-Life 1, sorry. But they talk about something. There is the incident, which basically in, a, in an antimatter accelerator, whatever that is, there is a, an unpredicted resonance and just everything. And Lots of aliens from another direction, uh, dimension, sorry, start appearing. Obviously, because because of physics. So now we will uh, concentrate in physics-based animation, which is like the thing I'm most uh, acquainted with and what I've been working for the last years. Uh, what we do be typically do in, in games is basically classical mechanics. We don't do molecular physics. We don't simulate galaxies. We almost never do thermodynamics or like exotic stuff. We think about things that are, or process things that are at the scale of humans, like that can be measured in, met in meters, basically. And we use, we use it for the simulation or animation of natural stuff, such as hair, uh, rigid objects, vehicles, uh, break, break things, uh, etc. The main two applications of physics are uh, and it, this is a very important device. If you want to put physics in your game, you want to say, okay, uh, the game is going to work with physics. Like, I'm going to make a, a football game, and we need the physics of the ball, we need the ball to collide, we need the ball to behave realistically. The ball is the most important part of a football game. So we need the physics to be right. They cannot, it cannot crash, it must look okay, etc. That would be play, gameplay animation based on physics. We can also use it for secondary animation. Secondary animation is something that we only use for eye candy to make it look right. For example, my clothes are not taking part into my talk. If I, if I do this, nothing essential changes. My, my cloth moves, I look more realistic, I am real. But the game wouldn't change. So if, when you see a character with a, a hair, clothes, or a flag um, undulating the distance, it's this kind of animation. This is important because the requirements are not the same for one and the other. For example, I'm sure you played some game where when you, I don't like violence, but all games have ragdolls, so when you kill somebody, the ragdoll ends up in a very funny pose or vibrating or doing stupid things. That's okay because the ragdoll is not playing uh, an important part in the game, not going to break the game because it's looking stupid. But if in a football game you just kick the ball and the ball goes out of the of the field and never like, gets back the game is over no. so if you have a bug if you have a problem with the physics of something that you use for gameplay uh, you have a very big problem if, if you have a bug or a minor inaccuracy in something that only is uh, only static you can get on and nobody's going to notice they are going to record or the video and, and upload it to YouTube and have fun at you, but nothing is going to be broken. Uh, it's very important that physics for games and everything for games basically is robot, robust, efficient, and realistic. And exactly in this order. I mean, if it's not robust, you're not going to put it into the game because your game is going to blow up and people is not going to buy. It. If it's not efficient, you will be able to put, I don't know, one hair on the head of the character, but that will, will look stupid. Uh, you need efficiency to be able to simulate all the hair or many of the hair of the character. And realism is our objective, but it's not the main thing we we need. We need it to look right and fulfill the other the other two requirements. So some examples of the kinds of models, the kinds of 
uh, classical mechanics stuff we we end up simulating in games. Uh, one would be particle, particle systems, things that are small, collide, etc. The other one would be rigids and articulation for characters, for vehicles. <coughs> Sorry. The other would be uh, deformable curves and surfaces for cloth, for hair, for example. Uh, even for cars, when if you have a very realistic car game, you can, when they crash, you can deform the surfaces and they look as if they actually crashed. We can also simulate solids. Actually, my thesis was about trying to do this in real time, which more or less worked, but it's still not ready for, for a game. This is Quantum Break, which just appeared. They use uh, solid object uh, simulation, like objects deform and break. This is a scene where there is a, like a very good big bridge and a, a ship crashes into it, and it deforms the, like as if it was uh, metal or concrete or the material that. And this is play, this is pre-simulated and played back at, at runtime. So your uh, sorry, your Xbox One is not running this simulation. It's only playing back a vertex animation of the simulation that has been previously computed. But at some point, we'll be able to do this in real time, which is good and bad for different reasons. We we will be getting there. I think in five years, we'll, we'll be able to do this in real time. And we can, also, we can also simulate fluids at a very, very simple level by now, because fluids are like uh, way, way beyond the, the present possibilities of hardware. They are very complex and very expensive to simulate. This Portal 2, this is a very simple fluid. I'm sure you've seen demos of like realistic looking fluid in, in, in real time. But usually it's, it's confined to a very small place because it's very expensive. So I don't think we'll see a game about you know uh, playing in the water and taking cubes out of it in, in the near future. But someday we'll get there too. So that's finishes the introduction. Now I'm going to talk about the company. You, ha you, can, ha you can find this information in the website, well, most of it. But basically, what we do at these the lessons are, that's not my, my sentence, it's high-end mobile games. We try to make like PS3 games for mobile platforms. That means that we have to like work very hard to get good graphics and good animation into a, a very constrained device that has a, a small a smaller CPU, less memory, etc. Uh, the company started around 2001. I got there in 2004, I think. Uh, it fluctuated, but now it's around 55 people. And we published around, I, I was going to put a fraction there because one of the games was canceled. So I was going to put 15.5. I didn't want to get uh, sad. Sometimes get, games get, get canceled. You work on them, and, and they just say, no, this is not going to work. Let's finish it. You delete all the files and cry. And we also did some tech demos for uh, companies that make graphics chips. They called us, well, not me, because I'm not into graphics. But people at the company made like new demos to show showcase this technology. It was cool. Uh, right now, we have two free-to-play games uh, running. One is, well, you'll see both of them. And the amazing amount of 300,000 people is playing every day. I mean, it's difficult to imagine, but we have logs in the server that uh, show this data, so we have to believe it. We've worked with all these uh, platforms and, and some other ones that I don't happen to remember. And we work with all these companies. Well, Apple should be here, but. Uh, so how do we develop? How do we program? Um, at this lesson, one of the main decisions was we'll, we're going to do all the technology ourselves. So we basically don't use Unity or Unreal or any other engine. We use some libraries like OpenGL or uh, OpenAL for some. <clears throat> but we mostly do everything from scratch and in C++. This is difficult. It also, it's also good because we have complete freedom. For example, if the iPhone 25 is going to uh, come out tomorrow, uh, if we get one of these things, we can program for that. And the same day, our game can be in the store. 
if you're using an engine or somebody else's technology, it may not, not be ready when the, the hardware comes out. For example, if you use Unity, sometimes you, you are a little bit behind the, the new hardware. So if you have a company and you want to sell a game, you depend on somebody else. It's like a risk uh, management factor. But basically, we can make games for things that are not yet available in the market. That's, that's the minus one there. Uh, the engine is quite big, and it does almost everything, but not everything. We do the things that we need for the games uh, incrementally. And we have separated engine and gameplay teams. So there is basically four or five people working in the game. Uh, I'm always talking about programming, OK? The uh, art and design teams are completely independent. And then there is around six, seven people who work in the engine and work for all the games at the same time. So we're kind of decoupled, but we work in the same game or in the same games uh, in parallel. And we also happen to have a physics system because we like travel and we got it. So this is the logo. If anybody understands the Charisma logo, he's going to get a cookie because I don't. Uh, now, how do we use physics that is the lesson? These are this is going to be some videos and examples of things we did. And unfortunately, I cannot, I think I cannot open them from here. No, so I need to stop things we did. And unfortunately, I cannot, I think I cannot open them from here. It's happening. No, so I need to stop things we did. And unfortunately, I cannot, I think I cannot open them. No, that's the, the bus talking or what? No, so I need to stop things we did. And unfortunately, I cannot, I think I cannot open them. No, that's the. Yeah, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, so this is a, sorry. Yeah, this is a closed simulation we made for a game, for a football game that was canceled. But at this point, it was not yet, so she's happy. And also the hair and everything moves. <coughs> this was in, there's some skinning problems in the hand, but it worked. And this was running for uh, 16 characters. And that's when they told us that the game was canceled. This is the collision skeleton. I wanted to show this one because, for example, to model the collisions of the hair and the body of the character, we basically put some uh, capsules or cylinders. This is really pissed. So this is the first thing we did uh, with physics, that is the lessons. Oops, sorry. Uh, then we kept doing. Hair simulation, but for a happier game. Which that has nothing to do with the, the other one. Which, it was really fun. It's a dancing game for Nokia. So this is running in a very, very low power mobile. And you can see that well, the characters move in a nice way, and the hair is not very complex. But it moves. Anybody, has, has anybody seen this game at any point of their life? Well, it's the only happy game we've made. The other ones are about killing people and nasty things. So I'm sorry. Uh, we also did some fighting games, like a game inspired in Bruce Lee with, with higher air physics and stuff. And we made the game a uh, racing, racing game. Uh, maybe you have played Split Second for the big console or for the iPhone. This was uh, for the iPhone, I think, 3, 3S. Yeah, before the, the iPhone 4. And here, for example, the car collisions are detected by the physics engine. And we had to do something like we had to work extra because the cars were going really fast. So in order to detect collisions, one problem you can have, for example, is that 
Uh, imagine I have a ball here, and it goes from one side of the of the laptop to the other. If I only check if it collides here or here in the next frame, obviously it has passed through the laptop. So we had to detect collisions in continuous time, not only checking that time or that time, but the whole trajectory between two steps. Because the cars were running like 400 kilometers per hour, something like that. Uh, yeah, well, this can be skipped. Uh, we made a bunch of um, basically sports games that happen to have a ball. So I know the problem of moving balls in sports games pretty well. And it was really interesting because we had to do things like, uh, OK, I'm playing football. I want to pass the ball to my colleague. But he's moving. So we had to predict where he was going to be and shoot the ball, not as we wanted, but exactly when, where he was going to be in a, in a few seconds. So we had to make this prediction and, and fulfill it uh, correctly. And finally, we've made, uh, lately we've specialized in, in um, three-person shooter games. The first one we made, well, the most successful one we've made until now is the Respawnables, which uh, please download it and play. It's free, so you don't have to pay anything. Uh, here, here there is no physics, but what we do with the, within the physics engine is all the collision and ray cast uh, queries on the scene. And the last game we've made, it's like the most realistic and also most violent one, is this one. Which is only, I think right now it only, uh, it's only available for iPhone 6 and beyond. But we're, we're porting it to Android, so for some kind of Galaxy, I think for the Galaxy S7, the more or less in that. Yeah, this is using physically based rendering, so we had to go the, the equation, the, some simplified form of the equations of light to. So that's basically what, where we have used physics and collisions in uh, Digital Legends. Now we'll have a very short overview, overview of what does a physics engine in a game do. Uh, everybody here is programming, or I mean, somebody has never programmed at all. You have all programmed. Okay. So basically, uh, okay, it's a bit cut. Uh, a physics engine is a software library. You, it has functions, you call them, and it has objects, you use them, and it computes something that usually implements only classical mechanics, so and human scale. So we can have things that have masses, uh, positions, geometries, rotations, etc. We can push them or make them collide or apply a force, and we, we will learn how, to, how they move. We can simulate how they move. Uh, to do this, we have to discretize objects or assign them as a set of numbers that describe their movement, for example. So what we're going to do is change these, quant these amounts according to the laws, of, the laws of physics in time so that they move uh, in a physically correct way. For that, we need the equations of motion, which in general can be written like this. And this, this simplifies to mass times acceleration equals force in, in the simple case of a particle, for example. For more complex objects, like uh, rigid objects, the M, the Q, and the F are more complex, but essentially it's the same. It's a second order differential equation that converts forces into accelerations um, using an inertia measure that is mass, or a resistance to movement amount that is mass. We also have to take into account constraints. For example, if I have a particle and I throw it in the, in the air, you know, you all know that it's going to describe a parabolic uh, trajectory. But what happens when it hits the ground? The, if I only use this equation, uh, either I model the force that the ground makes on the particle, or what I can also do is, OK, imagine that the ground is uh, the coordinate uh, y equals 0. So the ground level is y equals 0. I can set up a constraint that says the y coordinate of the particle has to be equal or above 0. 
We do this for a lot of things. For example, if we have a ragdoll, an articulated character, he has two parts, like the arm and the other part of the arm, but they are not free. They cannot move, really. They must be attached by, by the articulation. The articulation is also one of these constraints. <clears throat> and we, we will be solving the initial value problem, which means we know the initial conditions. We let pass which, which are the positions and velocities. We'll increment time, and we want to know where the object is and which rotation has uh, after a, a small time step, which is usually the time that it takes for the game to refresh, like 60 times per second, something like that. And it's not exactly physics, because collision detection is basically a geometric problem, but it's often inside the physics engine. So the physics engine has a usually a separated part that uh, gives you the collision detection and uses it for physics. Now, the basic features you can expect, like if you buy your first physics engine in the market, at least it should have this, uh, rigid body dynamics. It should automatically simulate uh, gravity, uh, drag, which is uh, friction with the air that makes things stop. And it must allow you to apply forces and impulses to objects so that they move. It must take into account contacts and joints. Joints are articulations. It also needs to provide you a way to uh, query the engine for intersection, not for physics. So uh, if you stop time and you analyze the geometry of the scene, you want to be able to throw a ray and know where does it hit the scene. Or, for example, if you want to create a new character in the scene and you don't want it to be inside the building or inside this, uh, this laptop, you probably want to find a place where you can put the character and not be intersecting anything. So you can test it, like put a ball, and if the ball doesn't contain anything, you can create the character there. And, and usually, um, um, using a, a physics engine, if some of you have done it, I'm quite sure you will agree. Uh, the basic functionality is very useful, but it's also it's difficult to make complex things with that. So in order to use physics for higher, higher order or more complex objects, such as characters, um, ragdolls, vehicles, um, whatever mechanism you can think of, uh, there, there is usually helper functionality. Now, this is uh, uh, an overview of what does a physics engine during a single time step. Like We advance time from t to t plus delta t. And basically, what Havoc does, uh, Havoc is one of the oldest physics engines, is it calculates how objects collide. It applies all the forces you, you apply to objects. It creates the constraints, which may exist always, like uh, articulations, or maybe need to be created and distracted, like collisions. When a collision disappears, the constraint disappears. It integrates it in time. Well, it solves the constraints, so it kind of changes the movement of objects so that they respect the laws of physics and the constraints at the same time, and it integrates them forward in time. So we get a new a new state, and we can then get out the geometric information and render the new frame with the new positions of, and orientations of the objects. Now, I'm sure you all know about some more than one physics engine. Uh, if, if anybody knows about anything, any, any physics engine that is not here, can, can interrupt me. The, the main ones, or the ones that are more used are these ones. Um, yeah, they are more or less in chronological order, too. And the thing is that, basically, rigid simulation is completely solved. Every, everybody does does it. Everybody expects your new game to have rigid, rigid body simulation. And it, there is no excuse for not having like rigid bodies in your game. Um, hair and cloth are also, well, the Y is yes, the N is no. Hair and cloth are also part of some physics engines, so you can have your characters with nice clothes and beautiful hair, uh, and it's simulated by the engine. You, you still need to render it, but the, the engine moves it for you. Otherwise, you will have to do it. There are only a few uh, engines that can simulate deformable solids, like the ones we said before. So imagine you know, a rubber toy that you want to throw to the ground, and it want, you want it to squash and, and change shape, not just rotate or translate. You can do that with uh, the two last engines. Fluids are, in a simplified way, possible, but 
not very practical. And the last, so the last column is, for me, it's a very important one. It's uh, whether you have the source code available or not. Um, when you use an engine or a library or whatever you want to use to build your game, it's supposed to save you time. No? I want to do physics in my game. OK, I can write it on my own. It's going to take a while. It's difficult. I could do it. If I decide to, to use a, a commercial or a non-commercial library, it should save me work. And probably the only way to assure that you're not going to lose a lot of time with the library is to have the source code. So if, if sometimes it doesn't work as you expect, or, or if it fails, which happens. I mean, you can buy a library and, and it can have bugs. And if you don't have the code, you're going to be screwed. Because you have a bug, which is not in your code, and you cannot even debug or analyze what's happening. So it, it's a very serious problem, and, and we ha we've had this. Sometimes we are used to, sorry, sometimes we are forced to use external libraries, like because the publisher asks uh, very persuasively that we do. And when there is a bug, sometimes there is a bug, we cannot do anything. In the end, we have to ask for the code and debug it. So if you plan to use the library, please check that the source code is available. So wrapping up this part and going to, to the last one, uh, there is a lot of benefits of using a, a ready-made physics engine, like everything is expected to work. Most of them are integrated into Unity and Unreal or, and into uh, content creation tools. So you get the exporters for free, the uh, interaction with other objects of the, of the game for free. And if you have the source, then it's OK. You, get, you use somebody else's work, but if you really need, you can get into it and analyze what's happening and fix it or, or change it at your convenience. The bad things are that physics engines Basically, all of them do the same. So they kind of focus on what the users expect. So in the end, all games have ragdolls, all games have vehicles, all games have a standard functionality, and the physics engines, especially the ones which are um, commercial, focus on these features. Um, there is not many engines, for example, that try to simulate thermodynamics or particle physics or the movement of light under relativity. Is that useful for some games? It, it may be. But it's not going to be done by the engine. Uh, the other thing is that when you have, when you wrap software with other software, sometimes you don't get all the functionality. So for example, if you use Unity, you normally don't have all the features of the game of the physics engine that is inside it. You have to like bypass Unity. You can do it, but you have to take it into account. And very important, especially for us, uh, if, if a new platform appears, you have to wait for the person who wrote, or the company who wrote the engine to port it to, into the new new hardware. Or if you want to write a game for, I don't know, a, a Casio um, calculator, because you are a freak and you don't have anything better to do, I mean, or you are really interested in doing it, you have to. Uh, Physics is not available for Casio calculator, so you would have to do it on your own. Uh, the main limitations of physics engines, of general purpose physics engines, one of them is that you cannot easily predict things. For example, the problem I told you before that you, I want to kick the ball and make it arrive at my uh, team player. With, with physics engines, what we have is we have this state, and we can know if, it, if I set this, this velocity and this position, what is going to be in the next frame? But it's not easy to know how to set these constraints so that it gets to the position I want. That you, you will need to do that uh, by hand. The other thing is that most of them are not strictly deterministic. So if you run the same simulation in two different machines or recompile your code and something has changed, um, it may, you may not get, get exactly the same results. This is very important. For example, I have a friend who did a meta game with Unreal Engine, and they were, it was basically a, basically a billiard game. So you wanted to see the trajectory of the balls, like uh, bouncing, before actually shooting the ball. So you, could, you, you would predict the trajectory, but then when you were running, not, it was almost right, but it was not exactly the same. So sometimes you would miss 
the shot because the prediction was not exactly the same as the, the actual animation. And it, it was because of determinism. So also, if you want to do physics over a network, like I throw a ball and somebody else in another server gets the ball and receives it, that's very also very difficult to do, and it's not automatic. And if you want to simulate like things that are not classical mechanics, you will have to do them on your own. Or the physics engine in a creative way to, to get there. If you, that, that's true if you are inside Unity or if you are writing it on your own at, at all scales or at all, at all contexts. These are actual problems and they need to be solved. So uh, this is like the last part when the, the universe uh, disappears. Uh, well, the title says Beyond Mechanics. What, what else can we simulate in games? Like, which is physics, and, and it's also fun to play with, but it's not exactly what physics engines do. The, this is a game called Pixel Jam Shooter, where you could have water and magma and other kinds of uh, even ice, and you could basically matter could change uh, phase. So you could, if you throw water into magma, uh, the result is some steam, which is a gas, and the water turned into well, sorry, the magma turned into a stone. So you had four different states of matter that were kind of changing one another, depending on, on some rules. Obviously, this was not real physics. This is a, a way to fake it, but make it look real. You can also simulate something like thermodynamics. This is a great game that many people hated, but I really loved it. Have you played Little Inferno? Have you hated Little Inferno? Have you loved Little Inferno? Because lots of people was like, ah, oh, the previous game was really good. We built like towers. Tower of Goo was the previous game from these people, which everybody loved Tower of Goo. This one was about putting things in a fireplace and burning them, which sounds really stupid, but it was really fun. And the simulation was really good also. And things could even explode, so that's why chain reactions. We can also pretend that we are simulating electricity. Um, nobody is simulating electricity because things go very fast when electrons move. So what we do is basically create a, a, a ray texture and pretend it's being simulated. We can also simulate magnetism, like forces between objects. Uh, Tesla graph. This is a good example that shows that physics in games not always guarantees that it's going to be fun. Have you played Tesla graph? Anybody has played Tesla graph? OK, you're this little guy, and you have the powers of magnetism, so you can polarize uh, positive or negative things, and they attract. And it's also a platform game, so you need to get to this place to push this uh, button and then get out. But you know the solution, but it's so uh, finicky and so tricky to get the actual physics do what you want to do that it becomes frustrating. Not to me, but to many people. You can also simulate relativity. This is a very fun game called A Slower Speed of Light, that tries to slow the speed of light, as the name states. So it's a first-person exploration game where you see things as if you were going at a fraction of the speed of light. Like, things bend, colors change. Obviously, you're not going at the speed of light, but in this universe, you are. You can also simulate things like black holes, pretending black holes, etc. And you can also simulate sound, which uh, how I'm, am I on time? It's very late. OK. This is a kind of amazing thing I, that is not in any game, but I really like it. So I'm going to play. So this is some sound simulation from the actual physics of the, of the object. This is a physics simulation, but at the same time, generates automatically the sound. There is no recorded sound at all here. They just analyze how things move and vibrate, the materials, everything, and generate this sound. So I'm going to shut up.
Yeah. So the other thing is that we're in a game. So we can do whatever we want. We are not constrained by the actual laws of physics. If we want to build a tower of like three kilometers high, if we don't follow the laws of physics, they are going to fall, the tower is going to fall or the material is going to break. In a game, we can do whatever we want. And as long as it's as the game is fun, it doesn't really matter. So for example, we are not bound by energy or matter conservation. We can just skip it and everything is going to be fine. It says Hollywood physics because uh, there is a web where there are a lot of examples of things that physics things that Hollywood does wrong, like movies. It's really fun. Uh, we can have infinite forces and masses, which is not very common. We also can have instantaneous communication, like uh, a ray cast can be instantaneously arrive at its, its objective or a, a ray of light. And we can use what I like to call ma magic constants from the edge of reality, which are basically things that you can put in the game or multiply, divide, add, or whatever, that if you don't put them, it doesn't work as you expect. It, they don't have to be, have, they don't need to have any like physical uh, demonstration or, or basis. They, just put that number and it works, so why not? You're going to sell more games. and So you, we can break the laws, but we have to do it in style. So just don't do it because you don't know how to make it right. If you do it, do it knowingly. Any fan of Judas Price here? I hope so. Now, this, uh, I think it's the one before the last. Yeah, I'm almost finishing. Uh, so the main challenges or the main things that are still not solved for physics and games are if you want to mix objects with very different masses like a, a, a plane or a tank and a cobblestone, a very small stone, um, the interaction is not going to work well. Because the, the way we simulate physics requires that objects are of similar sizes and similar masses. You can have objects uh, around 100 times heavier than other ones, but not one million times heavier than other ones. Um, the other real challenge is control. When you let objects move um, following the laws of physics, they are going to follow the laws of physics. So if you want, for example, to simulate a character that is working, um, either you simulate all the detail of my feet touching the ground and being kind of soft, and my skeleton, everything that is inside my body, up to a certain precision, or otherwise I can, uh, if you model, for example, a character as, as a rigid body, the joints are completely rigid, and basically what happens is, is that if you play a uh, walking animation, the character starts bouncing on the ground, because you are supposing that it's uh, rigid. So it's very difficult to control something that is simulated by physics. And it's not always fun to play a game with physics-based animation, because Basically, the, the player has to drive or steer the physics to accomplish the, the result. Also, if the AI has to take physics into account, it becomes uh, much more difficult. The other thing is that we cannot simulate what I said before, from atoms to galaxies. We have to choose uh, a, a spectrum of scales and stick to it. Otherwise, we cannot simulate all the atoms in the universe or even all the atoms in my, uh, in my fingernail. So we have to be very careful and model the things at the scale we, we need them. And also there is a lot of problems with um, floating, for, for, sorry, floating point precision. Like if things are of different scales, uh, the math starts breaking down. Uh, we are also quite constrained for both uh, dynamics and geometric complexity. So you will rarely see um, objects with a lot of detail being simulated. We try to use the, the simplest simulation model possible for an object. You can have a very complex uh, visualization mesh, like an object with lots of detail, but when you move it, it it's often just a rigid body or an articulated rigid body. You don't, we do, do not model, for example, the soft skin of characters. We may render it. We may render the character with soft articulations, but if you touch here, it's not going to deform going to be rigid. That's because we want to keep the, the computational cost to a minimum. And so, and with this, uh, I finish. This is like the takeaway. So if you got, uh, 
if you slipped off or if you were sleeping, I'll wake up and just take a picture and leave. Uh, the thing is, in a games company, everybody should be acquainted with the basic laws of mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, everybody. The artists, the designers, the, the CEO, and the programmers, of course. Otherwise, they may ask you or you may ask the game to do things that are basically impossible and very difficult to kind of program. So knowing mechanics is good. Also, what I was saying before, uh, real, realism is important, but only if it's not uh, stopping you from making a fun game. So do whatever you want, but the game has to be fun. And it's also important, especially in a company, to avoid get, being broke, which may happen. I mean, if you are very, um, very ambitious and you want to make a real world simulation of uh, every leaf of a tree in a, an open world game, okay, fine. You're going to either get broke or, or be hired by somebody really, really rich. But usually it's not good to have very, a very big ambition. We must be realistic. That's connected to this. Um, if you want to put physics in your game, uh, I'm sure you have to do projects and stuff. Don't add physics at the last time, like, oh, we, we're going to add physics and everything is going to be better. And we'll save work. That's a lie. Physics basically changes work for artists. Like, if I had to, sim to animate, for example, the, my cloth is moving, the artist would have to do it in the, in the modeling program, work, export, etc. If not, um, the programmer ha will have to deal with that problem, use a physics engine, and simulate the clock. So we, actually, you're never going to save work using physics. You're just going to convert one kind of work into another one. And also, on the design side, if you use physics for gameplay, you have to plan the gameplay of your game and design the environment so that physics works there. Uh, the typical problem of the ball leaving the camp and not appearing anymore in the in the football game, you can solve it by putting like high walls around the camp. So that's a design decision. Uh, that's connected with the fact that not everything that it is, that could be simulated. I mean, you may have the engine, you may have the CPU power, but maybe there are good reasons to not simulate something, um, and it's often the case because it complicates, uh, for example, it, things that are simulated are much more difficult to test. So if you have a, a very big game that a lot of people is going to test, an open world, etc., you're going to have to pay a lot of money to people or yeah, hire them to try the game, to make quality assurance. If your game has lots of uh, physics phenomena that look fine, but they are not essential to the game, you, you will have to test all of them in all conditions. Like, if I can throw a ball into that corner and the, co and the ball crosses the, the wall, that's a, a bad quality for the game. So even if it's not essential, you will incre increase the complexity of the game and typically, typically you do not want that. There are a lot of physics things that nobody has simulated, so don't look at the manual. Well, look at the manual of the physics engine, but try to think uh, outside of that also. Um, I already said that. And if you use an engine, do not expect magic. I, I, have, I also teach, as, as he said, at a, at a master degree. And people expect physics engine to be like the solution to all their problems. And sometimes well, we are lazy and we just, if a function has um, well-named parameters, we just call it and expect everything to work, except when it doesn't. So you are planning a physics feature in your game. As a programmer, read the manual, read uh, examples, and try to, uh, to determine if it's going to work or if you have to change the approach to, to make it work. So I'm finished. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. So questions. Who's making a game with physics? Nobody's making a game with any physics? You all did. OK. I was not here, so. Huh? But was it using Unity? Did you? 
box three, okay. And did you did you run in I mean, did you plan the game to use physics or the mechanics of the game were related to physics? <laughs> and did you run into any like interesting problem or difficult problem? Like sorry? Oh. Huh? Yeah. So, for example, did it like crash or sometimes things were jittering or moving? In it? Yeah. Anybody else had problems with physics or has a very good idea for a physics game that they should go home and write and become rich? Okay, so if you ha don't have any question, we are looking for people. I'm not contracting anybody, and I'm not going to pay anybody's uh, salary. So if you want to apply, or you know somebody who wants to apply, just send an email there and don't ask for me, because I'm not the guy. But we, we are looking for all the, those positions. And especially, it's very difficult to find people who really know C++, like at a professional level. So if anybody is like really into games and wants to be a, a good engineer and write code and write engines, uh, C++ is the, the thing you need to know to work at Digital or at Naughty Dog or at any big company that makes like really meaningful games, maybe not ours. You need to know that. And all, all the other uh, aspects are also important. So when you finish, you can write and Okay, so if you don't have any, yeah. Hello. Hola. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is uh, João Martins. I, I would just like to ask about the, the sound. Did you implement, sound. yeah, uh, in your engine you have uh, no. no sound? Uh, <coughs> no, we, we, detect the event, we detect the collision and we, we know which material our object is made of. So then we just play back uh, a sound. Okay. that has been pre-recorded. So, for example, the footsteps, when you walk on a metal surface, it sounds different as if you walk on sand or wood or whatever. But it's pre-recorded. The, the nice thing with that was that you do not need to pre-record it. You need to set the mat material parameters, run a very complex simulation, and then you got the, the actual sound. Okay. Uh, what, what I meant was um, about the sound reaching the, the player the audio listener or whatever. Oh, the sound that the, the player hears. That the, yeah, that the player hears. If there's yeah, any we, simulation. Yeah, we occlude it. For example, if you are in, uh, outside and you get into a, into a room, the, the way you hear sound changes. We do that. We modulate sound a little bit to make it. And I'm not sure if we occlude sound. For example, if, you, if there is an explosion outside the building and you are inside, you hear it differently <laughs> as if you were outside because the walls and stuff include it. We, we, I don't think we do that. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Bruno. Uh, my question is... A lot. I just, we, were, we were late because I was in Eurographics. And there is a lot of people doing research, not only doing PhDs, but doing like actually respectable people who are not young and they have a, a research trajectory that do things at least applicable to games and they talk about games in their presentations and they it's like a it's a very meaningful and and yeah an important application. So uh, for a lot of years, uh, like the uh, movie industry, for example, was the main um, client of, of research in physics simulation and graphics. But now games move so much money that everybody wants to like deal with them. So yeah, uh, I could say one half of uh, research in in real time uh, graphics and physics uh, wants to go into video. Game. Um, but they all um, relate more to computer science uh, than the game industry itself. Well, it's both thing. I mean, you cannot have a, com a game industry without computer science. So, yeah, there is lots of people doing. Actually, there is lots of people who want to do games, but 
first does a PhD and then they go to work for the industry, so for the game industry. And the other way around happens, but not that often. So yeah. Are we done? Any more questions? I have one. Um, Shoot. Is there a lot of feedback from the research in the physics of games into real physics? I don't think so. You mean if anybody uses the physics we use for games for real world stuff? Yes. I think there is people, for example, who worked in this and now are working in robotics and, and things that you can really touch. The other thing is that if you use physics for games, um, ideally nobody can die because your equations or your code is wrong. So that's good. If you are programming a robot and the robot is strong and can kill somebody, you have to be very careful. So I would never ever recommend anybody to use any of my code for a robot that can kill, because I don't want that responsibility. But yes, some people, for example, doing research in robotics, but only like uh, abstract research, so not actually building the robot, the robot use use for uh, science problems and stuff. They use uh, game engines for physics. Because the focus in real time is very important. And there is also people uh, modeling like uh, drone, drone movement, like planning movements and stuff. And they simulate the drones using real time physics. So yeah, there is a little bit of cross pollination, but mostly it's from research to, to games and not the other way around. Maybe someday that will change. So thanks a lot. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'll stay around for a while so anybody has private questions. Thanks. Oh yeah. Nice. I hope, I hope they had fun. Yeah, so sorry about that. I forgot I had the YouTube stream.